So this is a, a scoping review of clinical decision support tools for managing uh, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, and it's a, a project that was led by uh, Doug Rose at the University of Alberta. And apparently he valued my contribution because he told me that I was made co-PI at the end of the project, so uh, I'm very happy with that. Uh, and when we presented these findings uh, in Manitoba, because this, uh, this scoping review was uh, funded through the Research and Workplace Innovation Program from the WC Manitoba, uh, I realized that the findings were actually quite interesting that I wanted to share it in, in Ontario, and uh, I, I thought that since there was a little spot opening up in the plenary series, this might be the, the ideal opportunity to share it with uh, uh, stakeholders in, uh, in Ontario. We, uh, it, so it's Doug Rose, uh, he worked on it with Celine King, who's, uh, who did most of the work uh, on this project actually. And we had some uh, uh, really great team members, so uh, Bill Shaw from Liberty Mutual Research Institute for Safety in uh, Hopkinton in, uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, Nicholas Shaw, Jan Hartvigsen uh, from Denmark, uh, came into the project at the, uh, during his sabbatical. Uh, Susan Amahio, uh, Kelly Williams Witt, Christine Ha, and Linda Woodhouse. And a lot of people were actually involved in this process as, uh, as stakeholders. So, uh, some of the uh, some big providers of uh, rehab services in, in, uh, in Alberta, and some uh, you might actually know from, from Ontario as well, like Centric Health and CBI Health. Uh, and the Institute for Work and Health, uh, that, that would be me, but uh, I know that uh, we were in touch with, uh, with Quemby at some point in time about uh, uh, some of the, the search strategies that we, uh, we applied uh, in this uh, study. So what is clinical decision making? So um, Doug is at the, 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 part of the, the Faculty of Physiotherapy in, uh, in Edmonton. Clinicians get uh, based their clinical decision making on their training, uh, on uh, hopefully some of the scientific literature that we put out there, uh, but it ca can come from all kinds of sources. Uh, Dr. Oz is, is, has a really high impact uh, on, on, on patients that come up with their questions based on what they saw on TV, uh, on things they heard on the news. Uh, so there's all these different sources of information that uh, a clinician <laughs> uses to actually make his decisions. Uh, and uh, we always uh, assume that it's uh, highly evidence-based, and we hope it is. Uh, but sometimes um, things turn out a little bit different than we had hoped for. Uh, so Doug refers to this uh, this study as one of the reasons why he got interested in uh, in predictive validity and clinical decision making. It's a study from um, uh, Missouri where. Uh, it turned out that uh, the only association that these uh, these people could find was uh, an association between race and disability ratings, as done by a clinician, uh, uh, to uh, uh, that uh, that uh, um, between race and disability ratings, uh, and um, in the disability determination. So it's actually, in the end, the the final decision was made based on something that we wouldn't really want to see in, uh, in, uh, in practice. Uh, so there are different ways of actually reaching, uh, reaching those decisions. Some researchers in collaboration with practitioners have des developed clinical decision support tools. Uh, so a clinical decision support tool is uh, any resource designed to aid directly in making therapeutic choices for patients. So it's uh, collecting very specific information and based on the information that's collected, uh, come up with therapeutic choices. So based on decision on, on uh, information that's been collected, a certain treatment uh, is uh, is being recommended. So it may incorporate uh, technology and computers. So it can be highly sophisticated, but it can also be very basic uh, uh, to actually uh, support clinicians in making their decision to uh, come up with a recommendation for treatment. That was actually a step that we had to make in, in the in the in the project to actually come up what we actually mean by clinical decision rules. But uh, uh, so the purpose of our study is uh, do a comprehensive search uh, of information uh, for information on uh, clinical decision tools. So we had the scientific uh, literature and we had uh, we looked at gray literature and and Quimby and Mahut uh, helped us out in uh, in searching the the gray literature. I think you also checked our scientific search, but. Uh, <laughs> 
So we searched healthcare, computing science, and management literature, uh, and we tried to identify and uh, make an inventory of, uh, of all available to tools. And because it's a, it's a scoping review, uh, and so we, we had limited time to actually do it. Uh, it's more of a comment on the status of the research, so there's no meta-analysis uh, based on, uh, on the, 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 the search that we did. Uh, so we uh, located uh, uh, over 4,000 uh, articles uh, and then started screening in, in pairs, uh, in pairs of, of reviewers. Uh, and then the end, we ended up with uh, 116 uh, articles that were relevant, uh, that were um, for the data checks, and 17 uh, were deemed relevant from the uh, what oh no! So in the end, we had 116 papers that were relevant for our our, uh, our scoping review. So a description, yeah. So that includes the gray literature. Yeah. Well. So they weren't just um, academic papers, right? Yeah. Some of them were from from websites. Uh, uh, as you can yeah. see, there's a there's a, an Apple iStore app. So uh, that we uh, we uh, uh, use in uh, to scope the, the the evidence in this in this field. Um, so if you look at the, the disciplines of the lead authors, uh, it turns out that in the end, uh, all of them were, uh, were from healthcare. So just a minority was, uh, was a computer-based tool, so 4% of uh, the, the papers was about a, a computer-based tool. Some were uh, based on a questionnaire, uh, uh, the majority was based on a classification system, uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, clinicians do a treatment based on an algorithm that they provided, and a few were actually just a theoretical empirical model that was then later developed into uh, into a clinical decision tool. Uh, most uh, tools were aimed to uh, uh, make decisions in low back pain, so 58 percent, 18 percent on neck, shoulder, and arm pain, and 10 percent were on general <coughs> uh, musculoskeletal disorders. So it's uh, it's not limited to low back pain. Some people might think that I only do research on low back pain, but this is really more general. But in the end, the majority is actually on low back pain. So uh, this so we make we made an inventory of available tools, and um, two of the tools were. So for the 116 papers could be on, on uh, is, is actually on a limited number of tools. They have, just have several publications on, on the particular, particular tool. So um, the questionnaire-based uh, tools are the Kiel Startback Screening Tool. Uh, then there's the Pain Recovery Inventory of Concerns and Expectations Tool, or the PRICE Tool. Um, then there's a few that are about computerized uh, clinical decision uh, support tools. There's the work assessment triage tool. There's the the work scum board of Alberta soft tissue continuum of, of care model that's also uh, made into a computerized uh, tool. Uh, there's the, the RSI quick scan uh, that's based on a computerized tool. The, the ping management advisor and the decision support software tool. And then there were 38 other clinical algorithms or examination examination tools, but these are really the, the, the main ones that, that are studied the most. And even there, there's a, a great deal of, of variation. Right, now it works. So first of all, um, the first classification tool for low back, for back pain is the, the start back questionnaire. That's, that's probably the most developed and, and validated uh, tool out there. Uh, it was initially uh, made for back pain, but apparently it's being used in all kinds of uh, MSK uh, disorders at the moment. So the start back tool uh, uh, produces uh, two scores. There's an overall sc score and there's a, a, a psychological subskill uh, uh, score. And uh, as you can see, uh, they have a clear um, they have clear decisions what should be done in case a patient. Uh, has a certain score. So if, uh, if um, the patient has a really low score, uh, he's deemed to be at low risk for poor outcomes, and then the ad advice is to, uh, so the, the treatment is, uh, is, cons is advice and reassurance about the good prognosis of the, of the condition, yeah? Uh, so just a quick question about all the tools. Is this, are these tools that 
clinicians are administering to their patients, or are these tools that clinicians are answering on their own expert opinion? Uh, I think it's supposed to be used as administered to their patients, but in, in practice, it, I, I know that it often they go through the list and often answer questions for their patient. Uh, but it's to be administered uh, to the patient. And so there's an example where it's clearly they can give an iPad to their patient and just have the patient go through the, the questionnaire and based on that they get a, get a score. So with the, the, the start back tool, so if there's a, 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 a lower score uh, uh, of... Uh, so this is four, so there's, there's, if there's a score of four or more and the psychological score is three or less, then they're deemed to be at medium risk and they get a conservative physiotherapy treatment. If their total score is four or more and their psychological subscale score is four or more, then they're deemed to be at high risk. And then the recommendation is to actually provide a psychologically informed uh, treatment, so cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's a clear, it clearly provides a direction for the, for the, the clinician to uh, what, what should be done with this particular patient. Uh, so this uh, tool has been uh, uh, studied in a randomized controlled trial, and uh, it's been a highly influential uh, publication. It's a, it's a Lancet publication, so it's really, really good. Uh, I, I, it's, it, it's, and it's, it's actually just the end of a whole process that has been really interesting to follow, why, how they developed the tool, how they validated the tool, uh, Validated once again, and so they went through all the the properties that the, that the tool should uh, should follow, and in the end they managed to actually do the randomized control trial where some people they scored the tool but they didn't get the the recommended treatment they just get got usual care, uh, and the other uh, group actually got the recommendations the recommended treatment based on the the scoring algorithm. So in the end, they found uh, statistically significant differences in favor of the, al the algorithm-based uh, treatment uh, on the on functional status of so the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire. So this is actually the 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 the, the most important one. Uh, they also looked at sub subgroups, so the, the whether the low risk group or the medium risk group or the high risk group was any different. But I think the overall score is the most uh, most informative. People see the Lancet publication and think, "Well, this is this is great." There was a little commentary in the same issue from, uh, by Bart Coos, uh, who uh, who commented that uh, even though there is a statistically significant difference between the groups, uh, that the clinical significance of the difference might not be that impressive. Uh, so they they were already. Uh, a bit cautious about the findings, even though they went through all the steps, and that's really awesome. That yeah, Sheila. What happened to the control group in that? So the control group got usual care. So they were uh, seen by a physiotherapist and got the normal treatment they would have received uh, as any other person in England. And the physiotherapist wasn't aware of the start score. Uh, they 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 weren't uh, they weren't communicated the start score. So they made it into a, an app, so you can actually download it from the Apple Store uh, for $2.99 and you can start using it. When we presented in Manitoba, we actually, there were actually some, some people in the audience that, that had downloaded it and, uh, and shared their experiences with the tool to us. Uh, this is a tool that's supposed to be used in the acute phase, so when people have show up for the first physiotherapy appointment. And our audience was actually a group of medical advisors from the Works Compensation Board who see people when they're off work for eight weeks or longer. Uh, and they said, you know, it's a really interesting tool, but all our patients go in the high risk category, so it's not very useful to us to actually use this tool because we have no patients that actually score in that low risk uh, category. So that was, that was very interesting to, uh, to hear from them. But still, it's the best one uh, out there. At least it's the best studied out there. Um, so the, ne the next one is the Pain Recovery Inventory of Concerns and Expectations tool, the price tool. And I have to tell you about a conflict of interest here because uh, um, I was part of the development of this tool. And Bill Shaw was also part of the development of this tool. So we didn't, 
we didn't. Uh, uh, so we, we don't have a quality assessment of the of, of this tool based on our our opinion. That the rest of the team that actually uh, uh, wrote the part about the, uh, how valuable this tool might be. Um, so the nice thing about the price tool is that it's it's nine questions, I think. Uh, this question is uh, this questionnaire is actually 46 items, so it's much longer. So I'll be critical about my own work. And some people actually said, well, that's way too many. Uh, and in the end, it targets three interventions. Uh, it's either, no, it's actually four interventions because it's either uh, conservative care and reassurance, uh, it's functional restoration, uh, or a workplace-based intervention or a chronic pain program. First, there's the usual intake of the of the the, the patient. The clinician looks for uh, whether there are any uh, medical red flags, uh, so cancer, osteoporosis, uh, fractures, and and, and uh, things like that. If there are no medical red red flags, then they move on to uh, administering the, the the price questionnaire and and scoring it. Um, the low risk group gets again conservative care and reassurance, so comparable to uh, to the the, um, the start back tool. Then there's a, a cluster B that's a, that's a specific subgroup that has certain characteristics that, that was uh, labeled as having being in psychological distress. That's get, that gets a supportive intervention, crisis management, uh, problem solving, and cognitive behavioral uh, strategies. And then there's a cluster C that has specific characteristics that are clearly that have workplace concerns. Uh, in that group, uh, a workplace intervention is recommended uh, where there's an assessment of job demands, they con contact the supervisor, identify return to work barriers, etc. And then there's cluster D that has a clear activity limitation, uh, so they have high scores on that, so they have poor functional status. And they are given, uh, but there are no uh, uh, psychologically uh, uh, distressing uh, factors in, in place. So they get a, uh, they are promoted to return to activity. They might get some graded activity training and supervised exercise. So it's a real, again, clearly uh, supportive to uh, to identify uh, proper intervention in this group. So next is uh, the Works Compensation Board of Alberta's Continuum of Care. So um, this is not; these are not. Clearly, clinicians. So these are people that work at the the, the workers' compensation board. Uh, the continuum of care involved three components. They had a state application of rehab services. They had case management protocols in place, and those were actually computerized prompts. So when people reached a certain stage in their process, uh, the case manager would get a prompt on his computer to take the next step. And they contracted services uh, with uh, specific providers uh, to uh, uh, control the quality of care. And so the impact and effectiveness of the model has been evaluated, and it's still clinically used in the workers compensation uh, at the workers compensation board of Alberta. So they have uh, case management between four and ten weeks into the into the claim. There's med medical management going on at the same time. But they advocate to have active physical therapy at an early stage uh, in the process, and uh, and even earlier in the process, they recommend uh, chiropractic interventions. At two to two weeks, uh, approximately, they uh, they also do a return to work assessment, and over the entire course, they they look at the rehabilitation options, and and the options that are given are functional restoration, workset based uh, services, uh, chronic pain management and vocational rehabilitation. So this was studied in a, in a non-randomized controlled trial by uh, Doug Rose and, uh, and Brian Stevens. Uh, and they found that uh, before and after, uh, so before implementation of the, of the model, they found a, uh, that before uh, intervention, before uh, implementation, the, so the control group is a group of, uh, of people that have, uh, have a, a, a non soft tissue uh, disorders, so it's a matched control uh, design. Uh, they found a three-day difference, uh, so the, the intervention group was uh, uh, went back to work within 13 days, and in the control group they went back to work in 10 days, and after implementation the, the soft tissue claimants went back to work uh, after eight days, where the control 
claimants actually remained unchanged. So it's not a randomized controlled trial, but it's uh, it's still uh, um, evaluated in a in a I think it's a, it's in a useful way. So then there's the the work assessment triage tool, and again this is a uh, this is in the picture you see uh, Doug Rose and uh, Zilin Kim, who actually did this study. And we're not just focusing on the work we did ourselves. It's, it happens to be that we did a lot of, <laughs> of the work in this area, except for the the the, the one that we deemed as the, the best study in this field. So they developed a web-based tool for selecting rehabilitation programs for injured workers. They used data from the Workers' Comp Board in Alberta. They s looked at the internal validity and they found that uh, the algorithm that they developed was actually more accurate than humans in uh, uh, allocating people to, uh, to the, the best uh, uh, intervention. And they looked at external uh, validity, so they found moderate, moderate agreement uh, compared to humans, but more likely to re recommend uh, evidence-based uh, programs of care, so what we consider to be the best standard of care in, uh, in low back pain. So there's uh, some physiotherapists that are also really good with computers. They made this into a web-based uh, platform. Uh, and they, uh, uh, people can go online and actually uh, fill out the, the questions that are uh, part of the algorithm and then come up with a, with a recommended treatment. In this case, it's, it's Mrs. Green who has elbow pain, uh, uh, who's 42 year old, has certain uh, symptoms. Uh, there's no uh, imaging, uh, so there's, uh, the x-ray shows that there's nothing really, uh, there's nothing unremarkable going on. Uh, and the treatment uh, is physical therapy involving uh, exercises. Uh, and then if you put that all into the algorithm, you get a, a recommended program. And uh, the, the algorithm, uh, the first option that they provide is a work site based intervention. Uh, the second option, just in case the work site based intervention just isn't feasible or possible, they advise physical therapy and uh, the third option is functional restoration. It actually uh, predicts return to work uh, uh, as well and uh, provides, provides some confidence uh, interval around it. But, yeah? So what is the zero days? I don't understand that. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand either. So I think it's, uh, this is actually one of the, st the studies that has been done by Doug and he's really into what, what's going on with the, with the, interval, with the, the algorithm, uh, but it's actually this is really just one, this is a, a, an algorithm that's been supported by one study only. So it's really, uh, it's not as uh, impressive as the, the research that's, that's, funded, that's uh, the foundation of the, the start back tool. It recommends certain treatments to clinicians uh, and, and it's because it's supporting, they don't always have to follow the first, so it's not required to then do that that one particular uh, intervention that they really still have to use their clinical judgment to actually come up with the, with the next uh, the next uh, uh, step so in this case the the, the tool only pr uh, gives one option and says well you really should be doing a functional restoration program but still clinicians can always uh, divert from uh, from that um, then there's a, another tool that's called the decision support uh, system it's a a spreadsheet-based database. Um, it's only qualita qualitatively tested in one study, so it's, it's, it looks really interesting, uh, and it could be really uh, useful and very valuable, but there's really only one study that's, uh, that looked at, uh, at this uh, clinical decision tool. So we're really getting lower on the, on the, on the if, if we want to use levels of evidence. Uh, it's out there and it's interesting, uh, and it's used to identify ergonomic risk factors for work-related upper extremity disorders. But there's really only one study that it's been uh, been uh, evaluated in. Uh, next, there's the the RSI Quick Scan. It's a Dutch tool to evaluate risk of RSI based on work office er work and office ergonomics. Uh, it's been evaluated in a in a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and there was a cost-effectiveness analysis, uh, and it all showed that it wasn't effective and it wasn't cost-effective in a randomized controlled trial. But uh, I know the guy that did the study, and uh, we got in touch with him. 
and they still use it at the occupational uh, health service. So uh, Arbo Uni, which is one of the biggest occupational health services in the Netherlands, uh, still uses it, but of course they learn from the experience and say that they actually improved uh, their uh, risk tool and based on the improved tool they, uh, they sell it to companies to, uh, to implement and to uh, recommend certain interventions. So this is more of a primary preventive uh, intervention instead of the, 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 the purely clinical intervention that we've seen before. Yeah? And I just, I just, uh, we can leave for the discussion, but I just want, I'm not sure what you mean by cost effective. The tool itself is not worth so, it. So they, so they, they uh, gave people the, the RSI quick scan, and some of them didn't get the intervention. They, get, they got usual care, and, uh, in, and the intervention group, they actually uh, came up with recommendations and they made changes in the workplace. And they looked at the effects in, I think it's upper extremity musculoskeletal disorders, so it's repetitive strain injury. And uh, in the end, they, I think what they found was they, although they spent the money on uh, trying to prevent upper extremity complaints, they didn't see a reduction in upper extremity complaints compared to the, to the usual care group. So this is uh, from... Uh, to university. And then there's another tool, the pain management advisor. It's uh, designed to enhance management of chronic pain. It, uh, it relies on rule-based algorithms derived from, uh, from expert knowledge of pain, pain specialists. Uh, so, it's, uh, there's a, so this is one of the, the, the tools that we found through our great literature search. So there's limited information available online. And the corresponding author of the article was uh, was unresponsive. We got some feedback that somebody might know him, uh, but there's really we we don't really have any scientific evidence on the effectiveness uh, uh, of this uh, this particular tool. That shows that we we really searched really hard. So if anybody has any other clinical decision tools that they use or or know of, we would be really uh, interested to hear. Um, so there are also other uh, algorithms, clinical prediction rules, um, that are very popular for the management of uh, back pain, and the, probably the most, the, the best known, maybe this is actually the, the, the best study rule out there. It's the, the Fritz rule for identifying responders to manipulation, and, and in the same, uh, uh, it's the same uh, type of research, the LIDOS classification uh, system. Because from what I remember is that there are actually multiple randomized controlled trials that, that looked at the uh, at effectiveness of these, uh, this system, uh, but not all randomized controlled trials uh, were uh, positive. Uh, so there's, uh, there's mixed results and there's actually a, an example where, uh, where they found that it was unsuccessful. Yeah? Sir, can you just clarify responders to manipulation? So, uh, so they, they uh, assign people to a group that is probably not going to respond to spinal manipulation for the low back pain and a group that's likely to, to have a positive effect from spinal manipulation for their low back pain. Is that just symptoms or functioning? Or? Uh, it's a, they have a really strong theoretical underpinning for how they get to their classification. Uh, maybe... Do you know of the, the Fritz rule? I've never used that tool. No. Oh, sorry, but it's... But it, usually you would base it on history and physical exam. Yeah, and, they, and, they, and they, they also have this really strong link to physical signs. Yeah. Um, so this is actually a tool that's been studied in randomized control trials, and the initial findings were really positive. And then somebody replicated, tried to replicate the randomized control trial. And I think it was, again, done in the Netherlands, and they actually found that it didn't have the positive effects that they saw before. So in a sense, this, this is a really validated tool, but they just didn't find the, the positive effects all, all along the line. So uh, uh, this, is, this is actually uh, what I think should be done with the start back tool as well, but because they, they, uh, they did randomize control trial in, in different jurisdictions, but they just found different results in, in different jurisdictions. So. So conclusions, we, uh, we identified seven clinical decision support tools, uh, two surveys and five computer-based tools, and 38 other clinical tools. So we, there's a big report that shows them all, and they're all studied in, in, in uh, different degrees. 
So some of them are heavily studied, some are, are, are much less uh, studied. Uh, some might, have, some we clearly have promising results, like the Star Trek tool is a randomized control trial that showed some uh, some effects, uh, but the, uh, none appear to be ready for widespread use in clinical practice. If you're uh, if you're strict like Doug is, <laughs> so um, that's that's the conclusion that we have had so far. Of course, uh, at this point, I would ask. Uh, uh, I, I, I've asked practitioners to apply this with some feedback with the kind of uh, clinical decision tools that they, uh, support tools that they use in practice. But of course, we know from the Ontario Low Back Pain Strategy uh, when they, uh, uh, that they have a toolkit for primary care providers where they actually say, well, the Keel Start Back Screening Tool is a supporting tool uh, that could support you to, uh, to come up with, uh, with, the, the, with a recommended uh, intervention. Of course, they also uh, they also advise to use the pocket tool that's used by the Institute for Organ Health. Uh, so even though we might argue that there's really not enough evidence, uh, people are using it out there. Um, and one of the reasons why we say, well, it might not be ready for clinical practice is because we saw with the FITS tool that you might have a number of randomized control trials in one uh, one jurisdiction or in the US that, that sometimes show positive results and the other didn't show that positive results but if you try to translate it to a different jurisdiction your results might not be the same and uh, it, it might actually be the same uh, with the, the start back screening tool we've seen it happen with the Urbra musculoskeletal questionnaire that's been quite uh, well published on uh, mainly in Sweden uh, but when uh, it was evaluated uh, in Nova Scotia and also in Alberta, um, it didn't show the fit, the predictive accuracy that uh, was established in, in, in Sweden. Uh, unfortunately, what, we, what we've seen with, those, with that particular tool is that um, the Nova Scotia study hasn't been published because they thought that, well, negative results, nobody's going to be interested. But the Alberta findings are very similar, but and where they had the same idea. Well, nobody's interested in negative results. Uh, and what we heard in the, in Manitoba is that they are actually using the, what they call the Linton Holden questionnaire, which is the same as the Urban Musculoskeletal questionnaire, to actually uh, assign people to certain types of treatment. It would be really interesting to take this, the Kill Start Back tool, to the next step, and of course also the Price tool uh, to the next step, and see if it actually works in a, in a Canadian setting. Okay. So, any more questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you.